All right, folks, here we are. We're in uh, Hebrews and uh, uh, James and Jude by R.J. Rushdoony. And why don't we just start recording without beating about the bush too much? 29. Faith Triumphant. Hebrews 11, 30 to 40. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. And what? What's going on here? And what shall I say more more say? And what shall I more say? Okay. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of all the prophets and of the prophets. Of David also and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to fight, flight. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, and in mountains, and in dens, and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Hebrews eleven thirty to 40 It is apparent by now that faith is much more than man's act of believing. As James 2.19 makes clear, the devils in hell but even God and tremble, but mere belief is nothing. That faith which is God's gift manifests trust. In the face of all adverse circumstances, its trust in God remains unshaken. It requires no physical assurances of God's care, but trusts wholly in his word. We have a bold statement in verse 30, quote, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. End quote. It was God who brought down the walls of Jericho. The people had no idea what God would do, except that he had promised to bring down Jericho's walls. Joshua 6, 1-5 They simply obeyed him when he ordered the marchers around the city. Marches. Marches, traditional marches, traditional roads, roads. They simply obeyed him when he ordered the marches around the city. For this act of obedient faith, God, who destroyed Jericho, links it to the faith of the people. Next, Rahab is cited. Some commentators have tried to make an innkeeper of Rahab, but we are plainly told that she was a harlot who believed and was greatly rewarded for her faith. She became also an ancestress of Jesus Christ. Matthew 1.5 Hebrews then tells us that the men of faith are too many to decide. Try again. She became also an ancestress of Jesus Christ. Matthew 1 5. Hebrews then tells us that the men of faith are too many to cite. Some are mentioned in passing. 
from the era of the judges, we have Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and Samuel. After that, we have David and the prophets, verses 32 following. Kingdoms were subdued, justice was enforced, men gained promises, and the mouths of lions were stopped. The latter is a reference to Daniel 6.22. All kinds of amazing deliverance occurred. Quote, the violence of fire, end quote, was quenched. Daniel 3.25. Men escaped death by the sword, the weak were made strong in battle, and invading armies were put to flight. Verse 34. Women received their dead raised to life again. Verse 35. This refers to an episode in the life of Elijah, through whom the son of the widow from Se- Sarepta? Sarepta? The widow? The widow? Okay, just trying to get this. Sarepta, I think it's Zarephath. I mean, unless it's. This refers to an episode in the life of Elijah, through whom the son of the widow from Zarep, uh, Zarephath. I'm going to say, it's not Zarephath, Zarephath. Ugh, This refers to an episode in the life of Elijah, through whom the son of the widow from Zarephath gained life. Zarephath. Ugh. This refers to an episode in the life of Elijah through whom the son of the widow from Zarephath regained life. 1 Kings 17.22 And to Elisha's restoring the son of the Shunammite woman to life. 2 Kings 4.34 Lest we think that faith entitles us to supernatural deliverances, we are at once told that, quote, Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Verse 35. Their deliverance was in the resurrection of the dead, not in a rescue. Then, in verses 36 and 37, we are told of some of the sufferings that saints of old have endured. Stoning, quote, sawn asunder, end quote, killed by the sword, quote, destitute, afflicted, tormented, end quote, as they wandered homelessly, clad in animal skins for clothing. Their wanderings were, quote, in deserts and in mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. Verse 38. Our faith and our perseverance in faith is no entitlement to an earthly reward for us, however much it serves the kingdom. At the same time, Hebrews says of those suffering saints that, quote, the world was not worthy, end quote, of them. Verse 38. In spite of all their sufferings, these saints did not receive, quote, the promise, end quote, that is, the kingdom of God. However much they suffered for Christ, the Messiah King, the kingdom was not realized in their day. In verse 40, we are told that a fullness, perfection, or maturity of the kingdom requires that faith be made manifest in all its... In verse 40, we are told that a fullness, perfection, or maturity of the kingdom requires that faith be made manifest in all its richness. Richness. Requires. Requires that faith be made manifest in all its richness in us as well as in them. We must embody that trust in God that leads us to develop and apply the meaning of his kingdom, salvation and justice to all of life. For some, then and now as well as in the days to come, this can mean suffering and persecution as it has in the past. For others of us, this means applying God's law to all of life. For still others, it means expanding on the works of charity and mercy required by God. Hebrews tells us what things we must believe as Christians. Jesus Christ is not only our King, but also our Saviour, our Redeemer, who by his atonement makes us righteous before God. But it makes clear that faith is not merely creedal, but a mandate for action, the conquest of all things for Jesus Christ. 
Hebrews begins this section, chapter 11, by telling us, first, that faith is a supernatural gift from God which becomes our life and our new being in him. Second, it tells us that faith means the belief that God is the fiat creator of all things. Verse 31. 31, it's a three. What's it doing to me? My mince pies are on the blink. Blink the block. Second, it tells us that faith means the belief that God is the fiat creator of all things. Verse 3. Third, faith means that we, quote, must believe that he, God, is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Verse 6. Fourth, we are told that faith is not mere assent to articles of faith, but the faithful service to God's kingdom and to the needs of his people. Faith is not man-centred. We cannot assess faith as a human asset, but rather as a calling from God to serve him with all our heart, mind and being, and to love our neighbour as ourselves. Faith replaces man as his own centre and focus to make God the centre. It is a draft notice to man that he has been summoned into the service of his maker and redeemer, and he has no option but to serve. Hebrews is thus a mandate for Christian action, and to see it merely as a theological treatise on the atonement is to limit it seriously. The atonement must be the stimulus towards a new life and a new world, one radically governed by Christ as king and high priest, and his law word as our mandate for conquest. All right, strong words, indeed. Bastards. 30. Sons or Bastards Hebrews 12, 1-11 Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endureth such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, wherefore all are partakers, then ye are bastards, and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our own flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits, and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our own profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Hebrews 12, 1-11 The imagery of verse 11 is following, one following. The imagery of verse 1 following is rather startling. At this time, well before the fall of Jerusalem, it was unusual for Christians to be thrown to the animals in the arena, but the text here prepares them for such treatment. The reference to, quote, a great cloud of witnesses, end quote, seems to be the spectators of the Roman arenas, and yet, at the same time, the saints of old, such as those cited in Hebrews 11. This does not necessarily mean that these saints witness our sufferings, but that they stand as witnesses to the necessity of trials in a fallen world. 
we are not alone, nor is our own suffering meaningless. There... Blah. The cloud of witnesses fills the sky. We all have our particular besetting sin which easily hampers us. We are told to lay this aside and to, quote, run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse 1. The triune God determines our course, not we ourselves. Our duty is to do what we must, and in so doing, to remember the grimmer course set before Jesus, quote, the author and finisher of our faith, end quote, our forerunner and example. He endured the cross with all its shame, which he despised. Despite his agony and suffering, he assumed his task with joy, and he is now seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2. The hostility of this sinful world against Jesus Christ far exceeds anything we might experience, and we dare not grow weary or faint, for our sufferings can never equal his. Verse 3. In fact, the Christians are reminded, quote, Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Verse 4. None of you have yet faced death for your faith. Then, in verses 5 to 11, Hebrews tells the Christian community what it means to be sons or children of the Father. In verses 5 and 6, we have the citation of Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. Our sufferings are inflicted immediately by the enemies of God, but ultimately they have their origin in the will of God. His purpose is corrective, even as a father is eager to help properly rear a beloved son by correcting him when necessary, whom God loves. Whom God loves, he chastens, even to punishing them as needed. Verse 6, quote, If ye endure chastening, God dealing... If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Rewind! Whom God loves, he chastens, even to punishing them as needed. Verse 6. Quote, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Verse 7. In other words, to be a son means to be chastened. Ugh, hello. In other words, to be a son means to be chastened, and this is a mark of fatherly love and concern. We must, therefore, view our sufferings as aspects of God's fatherly love, whereby we are prepared to meet our responsibilities in time and in eternity. Quote, but if ye be without just time, <laughs> Quote, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Verse 8. The alternatives are clearly stated. The reprobates are spared God's chastising because they are not his own sons, whereas we, as sons, are prepared for our maturity in him. If the... If we do not suffer, we are not God's children. Verse 9 states the alternatives bluntly, quote, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? We know that our human fathers had our own good in mind in their chastisement of us. Dare we assume that God the Father is not even wiser in his dealings with us? 
the, quote, fathers of our flesh, end quote, are here contrasted with God, quote, the father of spirits, end quote, not because he is not also the creator of our bodies, but because his chastening of us has an eternal spiritual consequence. Then, in verse 10, we are told that our parental chastening was, quote, for a few days, end quote, as compared to eternity. Our human fathers chastened us, quote, after their own good pleasure, end quote, or as it seemed good to them, whereas God chastens us for our profit, quote, that we might be partakers of his holiness, end quote. M. R. Vincent noted, quote, holiness is life, end quote, and God's chastening is preparation for our eternal life. We are then told in verse 11 that no chastening is pleasant when experienced, rather it hurts. The result, however, is, quote, the peaceable fruits of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby, end quote. The goal is that we be righteous or just. This means to be governed by the law word of God, now written on the tables of our hearts. What Hebrews here tells us is that Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who makes atonement for us, then proceeds to remake us by his Holy Spirit. Our sanctification requires that we be chastened and made as children. When we are born again, we have the obligation to grow and to mature in Christ. It is childish to assume that our salvation completes God's work in us. Rather, salvation is the starting point. The newly formed regenerate person must now grow into maturity in God's service. To believe that the goal of our salvation is heaven is to warp the gospel. We are to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Verse the mat. Matthew 6, 33. The child who, after birth, fails to develop his mind and understanding is at best an idiot. The churches are... The churches are full of too many spiritual idiots, no growth converts whose lives do no credit to the cause. Hebrews, from beginning to end, is against a simplistic theology. It is therefore very fitting that Hebrews is followed in the Bible by James's epistle. They have in common a strongly practical emphasis, one very much needed in our time as in all times. Let us make the continue. Let's go. All right, 31. 31. Esau. Hebrews 12, 12 to 17. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man can see. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man can see the Lord, shall see the Lord. Without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness bringing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. But ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Hebrews 12, 12-17 As we have seen previously, faith is declared by Hebrews to be the supernatural gift of God. Faith, moreover, is God-centred. Modern Arminian teachings which present Christian faith as the solution to man's problems, saying, quote, Believe in Jesus and all your troubles will be over, end quote, are false. St. Paul's troubles began with his conversion 
and this has been the experience of millions since then. In a fallen world, the man of faith finds the world warning against him. Oh, right. It wasn't quite good enough. Warning against him, what is that? In a fallen world, the man of faith, the man of faith, making making progress slowly. The man of faith finds the world warring against him. As David said, quote, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Psalm 127. The Christian faces a double problem. First, this fallen world hits him because he is a Christian. Second, God chastens and display Disco plans. <clears throat> God chastens and disciplines him as a son. It is the bastard who lacks discipline. The son is prepared for time and eternity as an adopted son of God. Knowing these things, we who are strong to strengthen... We who are... Are to... Come on. Knowing these things, we who are strong are to strengthen the weak, the discouraged hands and the feeble knees, verse 12. We are to make sure that the sun is prepared The paths of faith are straight and even in order to make the way easier for the weak and the lame. Healing rather than stumbling is the goal. Verse 13. While conflict is at times necessary, normally we should, quote, follow peace with all men, end quote, and in relationship to God, quote, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Verse 14. All this is said to prepare the way for the reference to Esau in verses 15 to 17. The reference to Esau is very important. Esau was the elder son and the logical heir of the blessing or the promise. The Hebrews were even more privileged than Esau. They were kinsmen of the same nationality as the Messiah Jesus. If they returned to the temple and its sacrificial system in preference to Jesus, they were sinning far more flagrantly than did Esau. Esau, Edom, became an apostate nation and a plague to Israel, and even as the apostolic fellow. And even as the apostolic fellowship wrote, an Edomian or Edomite family, the Herodians were ruling. Good Hebrews hated and despised the Herodians. But here, the clear implication is that their return to the temple would make them far worse than Esau and his line. For all the care and wording, Hebrews here is very blunt in its... Hebrews here is very blunt in this analogy. The Hebrews, who thought of returning to the temple and forsaking Jesus were Esau's magnified. Their sin is spelled out. First, quote, Lest any man fail of the grace of God, end quote, or fall back from the grace of God. Since grace is a gift, those who perversely reject the gift are particularly wrong. By virtue of their birth, they are the logical heirs. To receive the gift of the Messiah Redeemer and then turn their backs on him is a fearful offence. Bad as was the offence of the leaders of the people who crucified Jesus Christ, the sin of those who followed and then turned back was at least as infamous. Second, their problem in apostasy was, quote, a root of bitterness, end quote. The apostate knows himself to be a traitor, a Judas, and the result is a bitterness that consumes him. It also defiles others, verse 15. Third, the reference to Esau now comes out openly in verse 16. Quote, fornicator, end quote, does not mean, as in modern usage, sexual offender, because in its biblical usage it includes blasphemy and rebellion. 
it is analogous to, quote, profane, end quote, literally someone outside the sanctuary, thus outside the faith. This means someone who is not governed by the faith. It would be absurd to say that Esau did not believe in the God of Abraham, the God of Esau's father, Isaac. He simply did not take God seriously enough to be ruled by him. God was there to provide the overall government and to meet Esau's needs when Esau so deemed it necessary. In other words, he was like too many churchmen. Esau, quote, for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, end quote. Afterward, when Esau wanted to inherit the blessing, he could not do so, despite his tears of repentance. Verse 17, quote, he was rejected, end quote. Esau was sorry for his act, not for his false relationship to God. Hebrews is very hard on easy believism, no less here than elsewhere. God would have readily accepted repentance from Esau as from any other sinner, but Esau sought to nullify what he had done rather than to repent of his sin. God does not repeal our past history. We cannot nullify the past, but we can remake the future. King Saul knew how false his course of action was, but he refused to change. He was unwilling to acknowledge God's sovereign power to replace him with David. The greatness of Jonathan was his acceptance of God's will and his rel- The greatness of Jonathan was his acceptance of God's will and his readiness to help David. Paul and the men around him were the... Paul and the men around him were Hebrews themselves, so this was a painful statement for them to make. The whole of Hebrews is very carefully... The whole of Hebrews is very carefully written to make as strong an appeal as possible to their fellow Hebrews to reconsider their contemplated apostasy. It is equally applicable to the church. Faith was for the Hebrews an option as it is... as it is for too many churchmen. As the general letter continues, the Hebrews are reminded of Mount Sinai when God gave the law to Moses. Their faith is no less a thing of power given than was the law then. The fearfulness of that mount and the occasion is far surpassed that by the... <laughs> The fearfulness of that mount and that occasion is far surpassed by the present. An apostate Israel then trembled before the mount, but the church does not tremble before Jesus Christ. This then is a general epistle as relevant as ever, and the church today, as well as the Hebrews then, is reminded, quote, Our God is a consuming fire, Hebrews 12, 29. This verse echoes numerous texts. Exodus 24, 17, Deuteronomy 4, 24, 9, 3, Psalm 53, 97, 3, Isaiah 66, 15, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, Hebrews 10, 27. Failure to understand this aspect of God's being is failure to know him. Note. Given the bluntness of the Esau analogy, it seems likely that the apostolic fellowship was in this instance reduced to Hebrews, for non-Hebrews to participate in this rebuke might have hindered its effectiveness. Hebrews thus was probably written by Hebrew believers to Hebrews in the churches. Okay folks, I'm tempted to go on, but I'm not going to. I'm going to stick to the plan. No, not that plan, the other plan. All right, so 
as always, uh, if you'd like to, to um, encourage me and support my work, you can do so by uh, liking, sharing, um, either or, both. Send me a wee message in. Oh, sure, that's great, Nick. Uh, you can also help me do more better work by supporting financially, either giving a one-off or ongoing donation, by going to nathantasher.com and looking for the donate button. Yep. Uh, um, I think my left leg is dead at this point. Not from frostbite, fortunately. Just got a bit of a dead leg. Anyway, thanks very much and hope to see you soon.